try to build relentlessly for the same people trying to solve the same problem. And, and I think that was like a, a core change. Like uh, it was everything that we were building was actually built to solve real problems, which was like 10 times more sustainable. The, the thing that was that would blow the user's mind was actually to have the DM trying to fix it in like five minutes, pushing it. And, and because we were using some like very flexible uh, virtual Next.js stuff, it, it could go very quickly in production. And like 10 minutes after they sent the DM, I was saying, hey, yeah, it's now fixed. You can see it in the app right now. So I, I would say like you have two kinds of competitors, uh, like a, a few of them that we just help each other, uh, just uh, sharing the contacts and, and how to just move forward together. And, and there was these other categories of competitors that just trying to steal your customers as you are um, almost out of business for the two days. All right, man, let's kick off. Well, Thibaut, I'm really, really excited for this. I've been looking forward to it for quite some time. And uh, you have quite a story, which is what I really want to get into today and just kind of go through that story and try to unpack it. But my first point on this is like, how does someone go from zero dollars to a multi-million dollar exit in less than two years 18 months from correct yeah exactly uh like we we did things so so differently than when we mm -hmm. fell our few startups before uh, i'm so i'm so glad we like we took this path um like i, I would i love forward i would love to to like to to describe uh how much we learned about it and and go for it hundred percent man so you had 11 different ideas that you created over the course of three months and then four of them had some cash flow six of them had active users four had cash flow and one took off why did you do 11 what was that idea so the main thing that we did differently this time is like we went from um spending two years on an id that mm -hmm. could be like invalidated leading to a huge loss of time to this idea of running, of, of building one new product per week and to just try to validate it as fast as possible. And if it doesn't generate revenue, just go to another product or uh, keep it in growth. And, and I think that's what we did for like four months and it, it led to like 11 products um most of them didn't regenerate pro didn't regenerate any revenue but yeah four generated revenue um on like three three of them uh, it just wasn't enough it, it wasn't enough to really prove validation and the last one of them was tweet hunter and from the mm -hmm. very day the very first day when we got user on board we just understood that there was something strong here, like uh, the, the growth was really happening, even when we were not pushing the products on Twitter. So mm. we just knew that we got into something interesting and we just continued. What were some of the other ideas you had? Um, so since, since the product iteration happened in just one week, uh, we had to jump into very easy to build ID. So one of them was Twitter analytics delivered as an email. Um, mm -hmm. Another one was like a um, community mark, a community database and a search engine that could let you promote your products on, on so many communities like Slack, Reddit, uh, Twitter accounts, etc. cetera. Um, another one was about generating tweets with GPT-3. And surprisingly, at the time, like AI was not uh, yeah. good enough to do that. So like we started generating tweets with this ID, but we actually transitioned to Tweet Hunter, which was not about AI generating tweets at the very beginning. And we came back to the ID of AI generated tweets much later in the, in the life of, of Tweet Hunter. So when you were developing that AI model for tweet under what was a bait what was it built off like the very first idea of Twitter was a huge database of tweets that mm -hmm. uh, was 
categorized, indexed, and, and with AI, we were analyzing your Twitter accounts and we were trying to find viral tweets talking about the same topic in pretty much the same way as you do to just inspire you. So the, the, basically the output was like a wall of viral tweets. And mm -hmm. just with this wall, just by looking at it, inspiration were com was coming and you are writing like 10 times faster. So that's, mm. that's how the MVP got super, super small. That was basically just one input field where you were writing like things like marketing and, mm. and the, the engine was retrieving viral tweets talking about marketing, but with like an AI layer that was picking just the right tweets talking about marketing that actually match what you are usually talking about. And why, what about ChatGPT? Was it three at the time or was it two that you were building? Why, why wasn't that working for tweets at the time? That was GPT-3 at the time. It was like, a, it was early 2021. Uh, mm -hmm. And we started doing all that in the, in the, in the winter 2021. Mm -hmm. The crazy thing is like at the time, GPT-3 was like six months old. And, and I remember that with Tom, we were thinking that we were so late in the GPT adventure, like in the, in the GPT journey, so many products were out there like there was this product headline that got sold even before we began it got sold for one million dollar so for us it was obvious that we missed the train and it was too late <laughs> all the ai product <laughs> have been built and it's so crazy to look at it right now and and realize that it's so not true and like you have so many opportunities coming right now and and you will have so many more in the next years to come Mm. What what do you think about that now, right now? Because I know you tweet about it a lot, and you had a lot of references recently in terms of like different applications. Like, do you think it's going to start being more integrated into like social platforms, whether it's Twitter, LinkedIn, like that will be people's writing, or do you think there's still going to be that personal flavor? That's that's a super good question. I really don't know. Like, it's because you have you have so many excitements about uh, AI in social. Like so many people yeah. are jumping on AI tools to just craft better things, it can be images, videos, or, or tweets. At the same time, you have a lot of people, and including me, that are not really liking all the AI generated reply that you get on your tweets. So it's it's really mixed feelings, and I, I have no idea how the, the platforms themselves are going to react to the AI mm -hmm. uh, thing. I actually think that Twitter did a very nice thing with the Twitter blue subscription in a way mm -hmm. that uh, with a $8 per month subscription, you cannot just flood the entire market with uh, Twitter bots uh, tweeting some generic AI stuff. It's it's just mm -hmm. not possible. So they, they just by, by making it a little bit premium uh, with a subscription, you, you they just block an entire uh, AI space, which I think is great. Yeah, that, that, that actually is. I didn't even think about that in terms of like mo separating out users, just being like, these are the ones that are bullshit made up stuff. And then you obviously have the premium users. I know the algorithm has a different weighting on that too, which is quite interesting. But some of the stuff that I think about like the AI world is that some of it isn't like good, high quality. Like obviously I told you my backgrounds and like podcasting. So even the video content you can create from it, like right now, just, just as of right now in 2023, it's just not very bespoke. Like I wouldn't use it for a client, for instance, and it's slightly off and whatnot. Now, of course, this can massively increase and improve, but as of right now, it doesn't look like it's something that can be used for everyone at every use case, you know? Um, that's when you need to not be an actual robot and be able to actually write your posts or edit stuff or create graphics and incorporate your own branding into that. Yeah, I agree with that. Like it's, it, it still needs supervision, mm -hmm. but I, I really think that it's because we, we just, we suck at prompting, not in a way <laughs> that you will, you will find this magic prompt on Twitter, on, on one of the hundred threads talking about the, the bad prompts that's, that will change the game, but more in a way that to make the AI very good, you need, you need a very, you need a huge prompt 
telling the AI exactly what you are looking for. And, and, and nobody is doing the effort needed for you to do that. And that's that's why uh, Tweet Hunter and Tapio, our products, are, are providing some value, is that we, we are doing this this work for you mm-hmm. of trying to understand what, what your tweets are usually about, uh, trying to grab the tone, trying to grab the, um, the topics. And, and we, we build like this very huge prompt um, that we send to, to DPD. And uh, with that, you get much, much better results than what you would have uh, directly so, on ChatGPT. So is Tapio and TweetHunter now based on GPT? Yep. They were not at the very beginning. Because like surprisingly, when they rolled out GPT-3, um, OpenAI prevented all the use case related to social media. And mm-hmm. my guess was that they, they were afraid that it would f- just flood all social media and that people would just uh, use them to, to do harms on social media. But the way they fine tune their models, I think it, it led to, to the models being like much, much safer. So they, they now feel confident to use that's them. interesting that. man that's interesting yeah it, it's been a little <laughs> wild story and that's a, that's the reason i want to get into some of it so i want to get into um some of like the actual funding behind it so correct me if i'm wrong but are all your ideas self-funded and you didn't you never actually used vc money actually like we we did for our first startups like the one that didn't work uh, yeah f- first like you have the, the thing is, like in France, I don't know if it's the case for the world, but I would assume it may be the case in, in the US. Um, like at school, at, at university, uh, people are telling you that this is the way, basically. Like you have to hire 100%. big teams, you have to raise money, and that's and that's how you would make your parents happy, basically, like by, by being important, by having a big team. And so, and so that's exactly what we did. Like um, right out of, of university, we uh, we raised money. We tried to hire the biggest team ever, and and we failed miserably <laughs> because like when you have a big team and you don't have product market fits, it's it's a nightmare to pivot your company and to onboard your entire team in this pivot. Because like basically everyone in the team will think that you have no vision. You don't know what you, are, what, what you want to do, what you are building, and, and you will lose the motivation of everyone in the team. So, and, and I, I think I needed these like, two big failures to learn that. And in this, in this new adventure, when we started about two years ago, uh, Right from the beginning, we, we, with Tom, my co-founder, uh, we decided like, not to raise money, uh, not to hire anyone, which we had to like, change uh, after that. Uh, mm-hmm. but, but that w- and, and, and also to like, try to build relentlessly for the same people trying to solve the same problem. And, and I think that was like a a core change like uh, it was everything that we were building was actually built to solve real problems which was like 10 times more um sustainable i guess yeah and on that basically you're looking for like real pain and i often see you write about that like actual pain problems how how important do you think that is right now because of course like people are a lot stricter with their money they're not tighter versus building just like versus like you know wants versus needs essentially yeah the the thing is like uh when you are not working on something and when you when you are like uh thinking about problems that uh you haven't really worked on you will come up with some very interesting like ideas that sound very interesting but actually Mm -hmm. are not good business ideas and uh, and and that's that's because like you don't have industry knowledge, uh, you don't have the the core skills to understand the dynamic of of the ID. And what I realized is that you need to start working on something. You need to like get your hands dirty to really understand the core problem of the users, to then 
work on that and provide a, a solution that's actually worth paying for. Or, How do you go through that process? Yeah, is it because like you're the target market, you're the audience, are you trying to solve your own problems? Yeah, and that's I, I think that's it's like a, it's a huge competitive advantage to to work on your own problems. Like the mm -hmm. the first startup that I built was about uh, motivating mm -hmm. your kids to do their daily chores because I, I like I, I love the I love education and working with kids and the thing is at the time I was not a parent so I was really not understanding the core issues of the parents and I mean mm -hmm. by that like the struggle of the guilt and uh, how you want to spend time with your kids but at the same time uh, you want to have your uh, alone time so I, I wasn't understanding that. And when we started working on, on Twitter with Toma, I was actually trying to build my own Twitter audience because I realized that Twitter is one of the best drivers for growth for all our products. So mm -hmm. I, as I was trying to build my Twitter, I, I understood the problem that I had uh, growing this audience. And that's how Twitter mm -hmm. is born, trying to solve my own problem in the first place. Mm. man that's a, that's a, that's so interesting because like so many people are hopping on like different trends and they're moving between niches just because they hear that's what we're meant to be doing like the web 3.0 metaverse guys are now the ai guys but they don't really understand the core fundamentals yeah. of why they're doing it, you know i think that's why i've kind of had moderate like success in the podcast world is because i've just done this thing for so many years that now at this point i kind of know what the the ins and outs of like how I should be operating on a daily basis. And I'm trying to, I suppose, serve in a service business, other people that do the same stuff as me, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I understand that. Like the, the thing is, whatever you do, even in podcasting, you will need to do it for a long time. So if you, if you are not working on your own problems or something that you are really interested in, uh, it will not last. Like you will, you will jump on the hype working for three months, and then just give up and, and move to another thing. And you don't have this, you don't have enough time in three months to really understand uh, the core problems on, on an industry and come up with uh, like original solutions. Mm -hmm. And uh, from your perspective, are you working on the development side as well as the marketing? Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's something that's quite weird is that, uh, mm -hmm. so between my co-founder and I, I, I am the one uh, who has has a, a Twitter audience? So I was the one like uh, doing all the push for the product, and and until very late in the development, all like the the support button inside Twitter was actually redirecting people to my Twitter DMs directly, <laughs> and I think that's like that's a, a super powerful tool. It's like yeah, every day. All day long, I was getting DMs about people complaining about stuff, and and I had like Twitter open and my uh, coding and uh, code development uh, window open at the same time. And I was actually fixing and modifying things in real time. No way. Uh, <laughs> the the thing that was that would blow the user's mind was actually to have the DM trying to fix it in like five minutes, pushing it. And and because we were using some like very flexible uh, virtual Next.js stuff, it, it could go very quickly in production. And like ten minutes after they send the DM, I was saying, "Hey, yeah, it's now fixed. You can see it in the app right now." And and we got a lot of tweets from users talking about how fast we were, uh, which was like a very nice marketing boost at the very beginning. And it's definitely not the case anymore right now because the team has expanded and now we have like some kind of based processes in place but yeah that was fun man that's wild because basically like you're also learning what you should build because you're getting all this exactly. feedback the feedback loop yeah. is so positive you know like i just keep comparing that to larger companies that i've worked at, as i mentioned and like you'd run a, like an nps score which is like a net performer score like once a, once every Jesus Christ, man, once every six months. And then you look at a list and be like, okay, we'll do this next quarter, this next quarter, next, next quarter. Like the, the rate of that you're learning and that you're solving your own problems 
is actually like crazy at that period. So th- that's very interesting though, like, because how did you have that bridge between marketing and development? Because usually you'll have someone like me who can't develop like shit and then someone who's a developer who doesn't understand the world outside it. Yeah, and, and the, I think like we are experiencing right now a total change in, in like the the way we can build things. Like you have a lot of indie makers right now that mm-hmm. are just building very cool stuff and they are talking about everything they do on Twitter or on LinkedIn. And just by doing that, they are building this unique relationship with their audience. The, the product doesn't have to be the best. The audience is having these emotional engagements toward the creators that will make them buy your products which is why I like I strongly believe like we it's obvious to everyone that uh, Instagram and other social media has totally changed the way uh, people buy consumer products what what was not obvious was like Twitter and social in general could really change the way people buy B2B products mm. and it's it's happening right now. Like people are taking decisions on which uh, tools, SaaS they are going to use based on who they follow on Twitter and LinkedIn. That's that's crazy. That's happening. That is wild, man. And because I obviously I've seen it from an info product perspective, like a course, uh, obviously like a SaaS product too, but courses and stuff like that are quite obvious. But I bet like Twitter and LinkedIn were not built with those intentions. This is like how, how the user interprets it, the technology. Whereas like Instagram for an opposite, like actually put in a buy button. They actually put in these suggestions to build brands. Whereas like, it's kind of like Twitter and LinkedIn, of course, grew these types of models organically. And it was like, oh, like users like yourself are building products that we need that integrate with them question for you off that is how do you integrate with a platform like linkedin like is the api open are you able to do that from a, I, I didn't realize it before i met teplio that's a quite sensitive question because like we have a, <laughs> we have <laughs> so they they provide an api but uh this api is really not as advanced as as the twitter one so like, uh, for example, with, um, with the LinkedIn API, you cannot retrieve your, your posts, your LinkedIn posts. So we have no, no way to build a, an analytics system. So we had to, to bypass that. And what we did is that we, we built this, uh, Tapio a Chrome extension that's actually mm-hmm. using the LinkedIn internal API. And thanks to that, we are able to, to get uh, all the data that we would not get from the official API. Interesting, which, man. Which is like a, a much harder technical challenge, but that's yeah. that's also why uh, the competition is is so uh, low on LinkedIn. Like on, on Twitter, yeah. be, before the entire Elon Musk uh, shit and, and like a premium API, you had a lot of Twitter scheduler. Like a lot, a lot of small tools to compete with Twitter. But on LinkedIn, there's nothing, just because the the, the technicals behind it's much much harder. I I kind of know. I I thought about that because it was quite interesting when I saw all those tools for Twitter. Because by the way, I'm not I'm I'm like quite new to Twitter. I've only started using it like literally really shortly, but I've always used LinkedIn. But uh, when I'm using, I was using Lemlist for sales and marketing and all this shit. And Lemlist has ability to scrape like details of um, people you're sending emails to and how they do that is true. I think it's true of Chrome extension as well as something similar. So if you're looking for the name and the job and all that kind of stuff, it's from Lemlist in that, in that, ex- in that Chrome extension. I have to admit, I don't know. Like, I, I don't know exactly how they are uh, building this system. We are the, the, the nice thing is like we are at the very, very beginning of integrating Tapio and Lemlist, there's just so many things to do. Like the, you can just like, what we have built on Tapio that I really like is the ability to get, um, to build the list of all people who comments on your LinkedIn posts, and then to take this list, find their email addresses and send it to Lemlist to then outreach on, on those people. Because, because this is not cold emailing anymore. Like it's it's almost like warm emailing because people kind of know you. 
Yeah, hundred percent. Yeah, that's really powerful, especially like in the service business space, whereby like one client can be twelve months of work. So if you were able to have like that like profile to actually be able to get that list is actually incredibly valuable because how people derive lists are like, you know, they have, they're crazy to to build these lists in the first place. You know, I want to ask you about that Elon Musk uh, premium API stuff. How does <laughs> How did that unfold for you? Like, what was the process? Uh, that was a nightmare. Like, uh, so they they did their entire um, takeover. Uh, so we we know a lot about how the employees got fired. Uh, but what what most people don't know about is that uh, very recently, like I think it was early late March, they announced that. Um, in the, in the next 30 days, they would transition their API from free to uh, an enterprise uh, an enterprise API. And that was like a, a black box without a very clear communication on the price. And so, but we, we, we just jumped on that. Uh, we, like the Twitter API was the the number one core component of of Twitter, so we just had to move to this enterprise tier. Um, the crazy thing is that we're not paying anything at the time, and Twitter, and we heard from other people that the first tier was forty two thousand per month. So this it was just in, creates a cost of forty two thousand per month instantly. Oh my god. But the craziest thing is that they, they didn't transition in 30 days as they announced. Just four days after they announced that, they started to cut off accesses to a lot of developers, including us. So a few of our competitors, not all, we don't understand what, why, uh, and a lot, a lot of other uh, Twitter products, and, and also a very big one like WordPress lost lost uh, its access we just we just lost total access to twitter so user could not post using twitter we could not retrieve tweets and and uh, we had many many other blockages and what we experienced was like a uh, like a, a huge urgency to trying to bypass all these blockages and at the same time trying to organize them uh, ourselves with uh, with other Twitter products founders trying to find a solution. And 48 hours after that, we finally got a response from one of the 10 people that we emailed at Twitter. The, the crazy thing is that all the people we knew uh, got fired. So we had oh my to find God. New, <laughs> new contacts at Twitter. One of them replied and, we, and, and she facilitated the, the, the transition to the enterprise tier. So we are now paying 42 per month, 42K per month. Oh my God. Wild. And was was there loads of like uh, controversy between Yi and as it was a hype fury as well? They were like trying to like take users from people. They were trying to intervene yeah, as they, well. They did. So, so um, the, um, the Twitter contacts that unlocked the entire situation, it was coming from one of our competitor. So I, I would say like you have two kinds of competitors, uh, like a, a few of them that we just help each other, uh, just uh, sharing the contacts and, and how to just move forward together. And then there was these other categories of competitors, like just trying to steal your customers <laughs> as you are um, almost <laughs> out of business for the two days. So yeah, I, I didn't really appreciate what they did, but like it's, it's business. Uh, yeah. They can do That's the reality else. of the world. Yeah, exactly. Oh, that is insane. And so how did you feel <laughs> during that period? Like, like, what were you doing? What were you working? You said you were in Indonesia at that time. So like, what was, the, what was your day like? It's like extremely focused. Uh, I remember that I, I ended the day. I, I thought that my head would explode. Um, but um, yeah, extremely focused, trying to find solutions. Talking to everyone, building, uh, building crappy things to bypass the blockages. Yeah. That is insane, man. Oh my God. Yeah. I want to get into um, some of the area around you bringing in more uh, people into your team. 
So you brought on JK Molina as like a like an influencer co-founder. What was the what was the idea behind that? I'm quite unaware of that like decision. Like, is that common in SaaS? So it's really not common, um, and and that's really not intentional. In the way that um, I think it was like a one month, two months after we we had the first users of Twitter, but we we started to DM some uh, big Twitter guys, like Twitter influencers, just in the hope that they would use Twitter and then then talk about it. And um, there was this guy, GK Molina. He was not that big at the time, like something like 40K followers on Twitter. But he had this, this extremely uh, weird reaction where when I DM'd him, he said, uh, that's crazy. I want to be in and that's it what? that was super surprising like we we never like and, and i didn't even understand what it meant at the time uh, so we we had a, a few calls with him and uh, he basically wanted equity because twitter and the way it worked at the time like the way like we were building and displaying this wall of viral tweets was exactly the the copywriting method that he would promote in his Twitch course, exactly the same thing. So he was like, uh, "Let's partner, let's work together, and I will I will promote this thing uh, every day on my Twitter." And the thing is, for us, like we we didn't want to have to 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 give equity to an influencer that would just promote a few times the product and then nothing. So we basically built this contract saying that uh, GK Molina would um, take the CMO position and would need to behave like 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 a CMO. So yes, he would use his audience and he would promote uh, Twitter to to his audience, but he would also um, work and activate many other marketing channels, including like affiliates, uh, SEO uh, ads, and other things. And it worked very well. How did you? What? How did you say yes? Like he was probably like nineteen at the, at the time, or twenty at the time. That's true. I think twenty, <laughs> twenty. But yeah, um, we said yes because compared to now, our uh, ambitions were much lower, and the, the goal was to reach ten k MOR by the end of twenty twenty one. And I think we did like five times that at the end of the first year. Uh, but yeah, we thought that we would uh, partner up, uh, reach some decent MRR and uh, and maybe move on. We didn't really expect the, the huge growth of, of Twitter. That's mad. But very, that is well. very rapidly, we realized that we were, we were pretty much right about uh, trusting him, like just he 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 organized and uh, operated a Twitter launch on September 2021, and just with this launch that he executed, uh, we went from 3k to 20k MR in just three weeks. So yeah, he just he he worked very well. Uh, I heard was there some um kickback from that was there some negative feedback when he launched people were like oh i want don't want ai tweets i want to write my own tweets yeah it happened but the the weird thing is that it happened at a very uh low volume and low frequency like i there was a bunch of guys that we like uh, one of them was peter levels i don't know if you've heard of him like uh no. level ceo on twitter um, he told me at the very beginning that we would get cancelled by by uh, Twitter people because AI tweet was not something that people wanted. And the thing is, it never happened. Like there was tweets about blaming us for AI tweets on Twitter, but it always stayed quite low. And I really believe that's because uh, people really don't care in the end if the tweet is good. Uh, you don't care if it's AI generated or not. And in, in most cases, very good tweets are um, sometimes generated by AI, but fine-tuned by, by humans. Because you, like, you oh, need yeah, 100%. human touch. Yeah. 
and you take it from other people as in your inspiration even if it's subconscious not even not even consciously but exactly. like writing structure tonality like sentence structure is literally inherited by other people and if you don't read that frequently you're going to inherit it from people that are on your timeline yeah that's that's what we do for like thousands of years like we just take inspiration from others uh spin it a little bit differently add a new thought on the content and and release it by yourself like true original content is insanely rare mm. yeah and there's only like a few people in that i even know who write truly or like originally like you know yeah it's just it's just it's just so like uh rare at this stage you know because like, of course you need to have your own abstract thinking for it um i want to ask you about that sales process so how does that operate? Like, you know, you were mentioning earlier how you built it up and you wanted to sell it at like 10K M M or R. Is that always your goal of SaaS is just to build and sell? Or do people want to build and grow and keep on growing it? That that was the initial intention because like uh, we really enjoyed these early stages of, of building. The mm -hmm. idea was like trying to reach 10K M R uh look for a 10 times multiple and so sell for a million and just start over mm -hmm. um but the thing is what, what we didn't realize at the time is that when you reach 10k mr it's it's much much easier to go from 10k mr to 20 than uh start over and go from zero to ten and mm -hmm. and valuation are also increasing like it's it's hard to get the 10 times multiple on, on 10k more it's easier when you have 100k more i was i was going to say the the multiplier was was it by two or by one of a or or am when i wrong sold... in saying that yeah for tweet under just tweet under what was the how did that function um so it's hard to answer because like in it's in in my head. It's it's, it's more like ten than one, but when of M -R -R. when GK is of A R. Okay. Okay. Sorry. Sorry. Because we when we sold, we were a little bit uh, below two millions in annual revenue, and um, and we sold for a number that could go above ten million. Um, if we work correctly in the next. Uh, few months and year uh, but the thing is like the business is so risky and it's so platform dependent that uh, the, the the acquisition has been built around a very a very big earnouts meaning that the initial amounts that we received was quite small and then there, there, there are like six different milestones that are revenue milestones that will make us unlock a new um, a new part of the acquisition sale how does that work in terms of like a uh, structuring like how come you pick that model is that just common in the industry it's pretty common to have a large earnout. Uh, it's it's common to have like 50 percent of the of the amounts to be unlocked in the next two years it's it's not that common to have this amount that is is correlated to the growth of the products and in our case to huge growth like we were below two million uh in annual revenue and and our goal to get the total amounts of the sale is to go to 10 million in annual revenue so from below two to ten that's that's huge but that's right huge, now man. i'm super happy that we we are on track to reach the 10 and mm. hope that it continues yeah because i i was so intrigued to understand that because i know you like sold on paper but then i thought to myself well with these payouts and with all the changes in twitter that's probably heavily influenced like the outcome of what's actually going to happen so it's like there's lots of different checkpoints i guess at that point yeah yeah and and selling was not an easy de decision like uh it was the, the growth was so strong that you can think that you get you can get more money by just staying in business. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's it's very hard to to like to accept this very high level of risk 
when you are just two individuals running running this company you know that is wild that is unbelievable um yeah. taught me through like the the lesson in there like so like you know for people like when do you come to these decisions to sell like when do you look to sell a company like what have you learned over the years or, or not um in the selling or in the building uh, i would say like a combination like when you're building and you build it and then like what like what's how should you frame it mentally to build something and then sell it the the thing is like i think right now that picking the correct industry and picking the right space is going to be is going to be accountable for most of your success right now like we we picked social media and ai and uh, social media is not, uh, it, it's, it's actually quite hot. Like social media and the creator industry was super hot when we started working and AI um, had become insanely more uh, hot right now. So we just, we just picked the perfect uh, growing industry uh, leading to, we, we don't have to do crazy, crazy tech to have big growth. So I, I really think that be careful and be um, like, just just right now I would advise anyone doing AI, for example, because AI is growing so fast that you have so many things to build, uh, just pick the right industry. Mm. Um, the next thing is I would really advise to not hire, to get your hands dirty and to build yourself and try to build for yourself too. Uh, in a way that if you are the first customer and if you are building something for you, uh, it's it's very likely that uh, tons of other people are having the same problem than the one you have. And if you are an expert of this problem, you deeply understand how to solve it and, and what 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 is value and what is like just a nice to have uh quite useless feature mm, that's very interesting man and how did you get that across that message across with uh with tweet under because like of course it was like a low subscription but people might think oh like i don't need this like it's right my own tweet like how did you get that message across that oh like you need this and you can use it for your business or your brand something that really helped with the growth was like at the very beginning when we started working on twitter on every tweet you had uh, the tool that was used to tweet the tweets. Yeah. So because we had a very premium product, uh, because it was expensive and very useful and, and deep in AI, uh, we managed to get a lot of big uh, tweet players. And so that's, that's a lot of people doing very uh, like viral tweets. And so we got our names, like Twitter written under the under the tweets and so people just thought like yeah so if if he's using twitter i should use it too 100 percent. that's, sadly, that's like, that influence yeah but twitter removed that so right now <laughs> we cannot <laughs> uh, we cannot use that anymore that's mad man that's mad but to be fair yeah. at least like you you got you got to grow when you needed it because like, you didn't have the brand at the time you know yeah that's that's it you know and I also think that just building in public, like sharing all the steps, sharing all the learnings, uh, is is really something that uh, helped us helped us grow. We also try to I don't know if you saw that, but we build tons and tons of free mini tools that uh, have the purpose of of serving one specific need. So, for example, we build one that is about uh, analyzing your Twitter audience and trying to define the best time for you to tweet when, when your audience is the most awake. And that's something that we just shipped. It's free. It's out there. Uh, it's something that people are writing on, on Google, like uh, what's the best time to tweet. And so uh, since it's it's not static websites, it's, it's like an app and, and providing a personalized, personalized answer, it's ranking very well. So we just all the, I think the 20 or 30 free tools that we created, uh, are ranking better and better every day and are bringing a, a huge traffic right now. That's awesome, man. I want to ask you on this about like, so of course that was a great success story, like start to finish, but when do you cut ideas? How do you identify that? 
You mean when I came when I come up with ideas or um you know in general like if you're building when you you know you've built so many startups over the years like when do you decide like enough is enough like this isn't taking traction this isn't growing and when you should cut something down and and give up so i would i would uh, like um spin it in the other way the way that um when it's not working you never know if it might work one day uh but when it's working you know you know it so much that it becomes obvious and you start understanding that all the other ideas that you had before was actually garbage what i mean by that is that um, there was this yc guy talking about product market fits uh, in a way that when you when you get product market fits and like true product market fits it's it's painful like it's super painful because people because people desperately want what you build in a way that will make your servers crash, will make you uh, die from the load of work, etc. So basically, when you know, you know. Like when it happens, you know. When it doesn't happen, you never know. That's super interesting, man. That's so like different compared to like what you would like normally hear. You know what I mean? Um, on your own, like personal note, like. What is it about like building that you love? I have to like, I tend to think that um, like to be successful, you need to do things for a long time. And so you need to, you need to love it. Like I, I really, I guess you, you like podcasting mm-hmm. and, um, and yeah, like I, I just, I just build what I love. Was that like, and- was that your question or? <laughs> No, no, you're, 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 you're completely, you're completely right. But like, you, was it always kind of like instilled in you when you, were, when you were young? Like, were you always kind of like into like hardware, software quite young? And then you kind of built up from there. Yeah, but I actually got into programming very late. And, and yeah. I, when I got out of college, I was not really good at programming. And so I just like, I think really startup being creating startups is one of the best way to learn hard skills, like programming. Mm-hmm. You just got, get into it and then you have to you have to solve your problems and there is just no one around it around you to help you so you just need to learn and right now it's just crazy how how many capabilities you can have with just chat gpt like you I, I use gpt4 to write most of the codes i write right now and it's it's crazy good like it's crazy fast you can, you write can your code. ask yeah and you can actually ask it to explain you how it's working and why the code is working and why it's not working. It's like, it's for me, it's like, it's the end of the old generation of coders. It's if you master that and because the old generation will not do the effort of understanding it, mm-hmm. you can just um, like uh, outrun them in, in a few years. Holy shit. So, so it taught me through like that process. So would you just have like a, like a bug or something you can not fix and then you would run the code through GPT-4 and then like, would it, would it point out solutions? Yeah. And the, what I do right now is like when I start a project is like, I, I, I build these prompts about explaining, explaining G, GPT, um, what's the project about, what are the main technologies? what's what is the main uh, like a file file hierarchy in the project and then i reuse these parts every time and when i have a specific problem i ask my specific question and it, it generally comes out a very neat solution that's perfectly on point it's it's crazy and you can just ask it to like a write entire scripts entire file uh, it's it's insane i really think that the only thing preventing GPT-4 to writing full application, full fully working application, just based on a on a prompt, is the prompt length. Like it's it cannot do that right now because mm. the prompt length is too small. So it it cannot assimilate an entire project in the prompt once it it goes above a certain size. But it's really something that I think is going to be uh, doable in the next uh, month, maybe years. Next month, man. That's so. It's so funny yeah. how fast it moves. You know, um, 
you know, so obviously there was like a shitload of tech layoffs, like loads of people had lost their jobs, like pretty much across like the board. And it kind of opened up the world to maybe like uh, companies were over, you know, overused on uh, resources to put too much money into it. Do you think from an engineering perspective, this will have a big impact in terms of we only need one engineer that can produce four engineers work because he can utilize AI? Yeah, but even more than you think in the way that's like all the lay of that they did, like a Google, Meta, and, and the other guy, mm-hmm. they lay of like 15 to 20% of the stuff. Yep. Uh, yep. Just just look at what Twitter did. It's it's like it's it's 80% and it's running. And it's actually, and they are actually shipping more features than they ever did. So like, what does it mean? Like, does it mean that those big companies can be run with 70%, 75% less people? Does it mean that? If, if that's the case and if AI is coming, because when Twitter did that, chat GPT was not here and GPT-4 was not here. So with GPT-4 and with the example of Twitter, I'm pretty sure it's gonna be harder and harder and it's gonna happen more. And I'm pretty sure like Meta and Google are doing this like this 15 or 70 percent layoff because they are just afraid of doing more, but they would want they actually want to do more. Yeah. If if they had their way, they would rebuild the company again. They'd have like less middle management, less less managers here, like less people in like even like HR and stuff, because you could yeah, automate so all of it, no? You know? So if they yeah, had, and- they they're pretty much over a burden as a result at the moment operationally. Yeah. And and it's not only about AI, like what's Tweet Hunter and Taprio are built on a technology that is called serverless, which which basically is um is uh we are running all our backend architectures uh, without servers. It's 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 cloud, but uh it, it's 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 like cloud 2.0 in a way that we don't manage servers, so we don't manage loads, we don't manage complicated things. And so what we did um, this year, uh, just me at the very beginning, would have required like 10 to 20 people 10 years ago. It's it's insane. Oh my God. <laughs> and I'm not talking about AI here. So yeah, I, yeah. I truly think that we are living in the best time ever for developers and makers to build very complicated, very complicated things alone or in with the very, very small teams. That is, is that the, would that be the same for mobile apps that you're serverless? Is that possible? Um, like both mobile apps and SaaS, uh, in, in, uh, in most cases, they require servers and, and codes running on servers. So yes, all, all this code running on the server can be um, can run on serverless technologies that uh, will not require any servers and saving so much time for your developers. Man, that is uh, literally blowing my mind. It's, it's, it's so it's so crazy how like there's this opportunity, but so many people would overlook it, and especially especially companies. You know, um, like one of my clients, I find this quite interesting. One of my podcast clients made a really good point, saying that like. It's we have all these resources out here now. Some are like and not even AI, just like um, automation, like AI or like any other way to streamline operations. But most people have their head in the sand looking at it, and it will take them twenty four months, thirty six months to catch up to any sort of speed. Whereas if people like you, who are who's literally in the Alps right now, are just churning out these features, you know, because you know what's yeah. available to you. I truly think that we we are gonna leave the biggest rotation of of uh, softwares and companies in the world. Like meaning meaning tons of companies are gonna die, and tons of new companies are gonna be born and thrive. Hundred percent, and I think also people can actually utilize it in a different way. Um, I want to just finish up with like your next uh, your next steps. Like, what's your what's your next goal now? What are you looking to do next? I have no idea. <laughs> so, like <laughs> r- right now, in the in the short term, uh, in the short term, I will work with uh, Lempire to grow Twitter and Tapio to ten million in annual revenue. Um, and I think it's we are totally on track 
for that, uh, especially on Papio, it's growing so fast and tons of people are jumping on it. After that, I don't know, like I, I really feel this AI uh, FOMO, like I want to build so many AI products right now. <laughs> uh, I have no, I have no idea if if uh, I will I will do it um, with Empire uh, as an employer or if I will just uh, continue to do it myself. I don't know. Yeah, man, you, you have plenty of time to discuss those things. Of course, of course, you know. But it's just interesting to see how your like your brain works. Like that's why I enjoy these conversations so much because like you have so many ideas, you can patch them together and then you can build them, which is such a dangerous combination to be able to go after those things, which is awesome. That's that's the gap for a lot of people that you've already filled for yourself. Yep. What about you? Honest, well, the idea, man, is that I'm I'm heavy building this agency full time, but I'm utilizing everything around me, you know? So I have a very small team. I only have two people with me. Um, one's on video production, one's on graphics. And we're just looking for, you know, bigger clients, bigger company clients. And, um, really in the kind of b2b space so that's that's the goal you know just head down on that for the next the next couple of years you know i don't have any uh i don't try to split my focus i just try to stay within my lane to try to keep building you know nice good nice man people i want to say a massive thank you i appreciate this um of course like there's so much different things we can get get, get go back and forth on but uh, i want to say a massive thank you man uh, thank you very much for having me it was it was very my pleasure, pleasure man